Hi everyone and welcome to Team West Covina, a crazy ex-girlfriend podcast. I'm your host Paisley and today is Friday, June 8th, 2018. This is episode 6 of the podcast and we're discussing the episode I'm going on a date with Josh's friend, season 1, episode 4. It aired on November 2nd, 2015, was written by Aaron Ehrlich and directed by Stuart McDonald. The IMBD synopsis says, in an attempt to get her mind off Josh, Rebecca flirts with notions of having sex with a stranger and settling for Greg. Meanwhile, Heather studies Rebecca for her psychology class, and Josh tries to land a new job. As always, there's a spoiler warning. I may be discussing any episodes that have aired so far in the series. So let's jump right into the analysis. First, we see Rebecca and Paula at the skateboarding park. And Paula mentions that Tony Hawk Fan 49 on YouTube was the channel they watched to get skateboarding advice. Okay, so here's the interesting thing. I googled that username, and there is one on YouTube, but the only video, which was indeed skateboarding related, was posted very recently, on May 15th, 2018. And I was only the second person to view it. I'll put the link in the show notes in case you guys want to check it out. It would be funny if they actually used it in the background of season 4. Rebecca says to Paula, Josh hit the skate park with his nephew every Saturday morning, but do any of his sisters actually have kids? This could be explained by saying it's another one of Rebecca's lies. Bex kind of makes it sound like she's learning how to skate just so that she and Josh will have something to do together that he's into. What are your thoughts on learning more about an interest because a potential significant other enjoys it? How far is too far? I think if it's something you're curious about anyway, or something that you'd probably go do if a friend asked you to do it, that all seems pretty straightforward. It's more like when you're doing something you absolutely hate or would never go do with anyone else that it becomes more problematic. Rebecca doesn't seem too keen on physical activity, and she looks like she's going to hurt herself skateboarding, but... I think maybe Josh and Rebecca, you know, don't have a lot of interest in common, so she might have been trying to to fix that. I was also wondering, when did Valencia say it was cool for Rebecca and Josh to hang out? We know from the last episode, Josh was going to stand up to her and say he was going to hang out with Rebecca regardless, but I can't imagine that not leading to a big fight, especially so soon after everything went down. Rebecca says something about Josh to Paula. She says that's what he does. He pops up, disappears, pops up, disappears. It's hilarious. There's an early reference to love kernels here indirectly, and Rebecca's trying so hard to put a good spin on it and maintain a positive attitude. I think a lot of people would think she was being dumb or pathetic here, but I want to challenge that viewpoint a little bit because her attitude stems from a guy's hot and cold behavior in which he's encouraging one minute and gone the next. We instinctively judge the woman, forgetting that she's reacting to behavior that's worse. Josh isn't consistent as a friend, or later on is something more. He often gives her love kernels in a way that can be really detrimental. But in these early stages, Josh really doesn't have that much responsibility to Rebecca. She just moved into town. They are getting to know each other again after a long hiatus. He's busy with other stuff. He just came back from this trip with Valencia. There's probably good reasons why he hasn't gotten back to her about hanging out. Rebecca gets a notification from Instagram, and she sees that Valencia Maria Perez has posted. Valencia's got four captions on her pictures. The first one says, I had a great time traveling with my boyfriend this weekend. Next, it's nuzzling with my man drinking in the sights. Third, we've got drinking in the wonderful wine alongside my wonderful man. And then time to work off all the great wine that we got to enjoy. Each photo got exactly five likes, by the way. I checked Valencia's Instagram handle in real life, and there is actually one, although whether it was created by fans or the show, who knows. She's only following one person, Josh Chan 91791 It's really funny when art becomes life. Josh, by the way, is only following two people, Valencia and Rebecca Bunch. Rebecca is only following Valencia and Josh, too, but Rachel Bloom is following Rebecca. It's a complicated social media world, people. Rebecca has this funny statement about her mom that I hadn't caught the first time around. She says, she's like a stalker I used to live inside of. It's a perfect description. 
Dr. Weinstein, Rebecca's family doctor, gets on her mom's FaceTime and says, UTI's under control? So apparently Rebecca's had UTI issues before. It's funny since this comes up later in the season. Meanwhile, her mom is throwing it in her face that Audra Levine just got married to a hedge fund manager and took the promotion that Rebecca turned down. There's all this competition and comparisons between them. It makes it hard for Rebecca to take chances or break out of her shell because she's always got to keep up with this like internal competition between her and Audra. And breaking out of that pattern and moving to West Covina and getting out of the rat race is you know, something she it sounds like she's never done before and she's consciously stepping back from that competition and saying no it's it's not a comparison i'm gonna live my life i'm not concerned what audra's doing even though you can tell it it still bothers her and she's still trying to get used to not rating her life based on other people's lives you know she just looked at valencia on instagram she just heard her mom compare it to audra it's tough Paula says she has to pick up Brendan from therapy. This is surprising. I can see Tommy going to therapy because we know he was diagnosed with a lot of issues. But the fact that Paula got Brendan to go to therapy is pretty huge. He seems like someone who would resist. I also wonder if Brendan sees one of the Ecopians or someone else. Since Paula and her husband Scott later see Father Bra in a type of therapy session it's possible that paul is sending brendan to him i can actually see brendan maybe agreeing to that since father bra is pretty cool and he might get brendan on a level that you know maybe other therapists wouldn't be able to get through to him on we have to give some kudos to paula here she may not always know what to do with her kids but she got them outside help on the sidewalk near home rebecca and heather bump into each other Rebecca calls Heather Head for perhaps the first time, and she responds, it's Heather. Of course, we see that exchange between them quite a bit throughout the series. So Heather has this idea for Rebecca. She thinks that Rebecca should try Tinder, and Heather comes with Rebecca to meet this guy at a bar, and Rebecca basically makes out with him as soon as she meets him. And Heather says, subject demonstrates lack of judgment combined with poor impulse control. And then she immediately turns to the guy sitting next to her at the bar and says, do you want to get weird? It's kind of funny because Heather was the one who suggested Bex try Tinder for sex in the first place. So it seemed a little bit hypocritical, although I think Heather's probably referring to the fact that Rebecca can be a little bit socially awkward and she does things that other people maybe wouldn't. And... She's obviously not super comfortable in that one night stand situation. Heather seems more comfortable dating around and it seems like she's done this before and maybe that's what the difference is in Heather's mind. But it certainly seems like they're both going to basically run off with guys right away. After Rebecca leaves the room for a moment at her house with this guy from Tinder, she spies the butter commercial on TV. Do you feel disgusted and uneasy with your current butter? Are you making healthy choices? It's never too late to get the life and the butter you deserve. Rebecca's relying on signs to either tell her what to do or validate what she wants to do. And this is very much a part of living in that musical, living in that storyline where a sign will be a turning point and lead to a happy ending. The next day at work, Rebecca tells Paula she's into all the good stuff now. Kabbalah, bee pollen, colonics, Buddhism, veganism. In case you guys don't know what colonics is, lest we miss a good poop reference, and we know Rachel loves those, it refers to the infusion of liquid into the colon through a tube in the rectum. Ouch. Medicine Net says it is claimed that colonics detoxify and cleanse the body and have other health benefits, but there is no convincing scientific evidence to support these claims, and in some cases, it may even do harm. So Rebecca's into all these fads that are supposedly healthy, but maybe not really, and it's kind of a mix, and she's just kind of grabbing at every possible one and seeing what sticks. The real thing is that none of them are really her. She didn't, you know, say come to Buddhism or veganism naturally. She's just doing all of them at once in an attempt to be healthy. At home base, Greg is talking with Chris. He tells him, I like Rebecca, but I don't like Rebecca. 
I have very positive feelings of attraction towards her, but I also kind of want to punch her in the arm. Chris isn't worried about this. He says it sounds like fifth grade to him. But we know that Greg tends to fall for girls he has both positive and negative feelings about. He's still got that chip in his shoulder, that resentment towards women. So he can go on a date with Rebecca and be really happy that she said yes. But at the same time, he's kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop, waiting for her to reject him or disappoint him or treat him badly. And so he kind of makes all these little digs at her almost before anything bad has even happened. He, he's kind of preemptively picking at her. And I think, you know, that's a common pattern for Greg. And it's, he's a little bit self sabotage you know. He also says to Chris, she likes someone else, okay? I know it for a fact. I mean, I know it, but I don't know it, know it. It sounds like because Rebecca never confirmed what Greg said to her about Josh at her party, he's still second-guessing what the deal is there. He's got a pretty good sense of what probably happened, but Greg seems to really want full confirmation from Rebecca. Meanwhile, Josh comes into home base, and he's pretty worried about having to get a job. He says he'll take anything, and Greg suggests that he could work at home base. And Josh is all like, oh god, no, are you kidding me? I haven't completely given up. So he's almost oblivious to the fact that, you know, this is a real judgment on Greg. And it's also funny, since we know Josh later does work there at a, a very low point in his life. But... Josh sort of has this implicit idea that, oh yeah, it's, it's okay for Greg to work at home base, but I would never do that, or I would never sink that low. Or He sort of thinks of himself as the main character amongst his friends. But when Rebecca comes into home base, Josh is all macho and doesn't mention his insecurities about money. He says his vacation was perfection all around. When Greg tries to catch Rebecca by herself so he can ask her out, she says, can we just talk over there? And he says, no, let's leave the children out of this, referring to both Chris and Josh. So Josh, like Rebecca, is a child instead of an adult. Rebecca says to Greg, I think I need to be with an older guy, maybe like a professor or... So this is a nice early reference to Robert, who was a professor at Harvard. And we know kind of what she might be thinking, rewatching it. She had Josh as this fantasy when we meet her, but because that's not working out in her mind, she's kind of reverting back to that old fantasy. Greg is pretty upfront with Rebecca. He says he likes her, even though he says, you're not that nice to me and you're weird. So Greg calls her weird, just like Josh did in high school. I wonder if that's an indication Rebecca shouldn't be with a guy, if they call her weird, or if Rebecca should just get comfortable with and happy about being weird, and own it as a strength, not a weakness. There's a question on one of the dating sites that asks, would you rather be normal or weird? And I picked weird. Greg says that he knows Rebecca has feelings for Josh, and she says, no, I don't have feelings for Josh, and he shushes her. He spends a lot of this episode trying to get confirmation of what really happened in New York. You see him bring it up again and again. Then Greg launches into Settle For Me, one of my favorites. And I have this question, is, is Rebecca in Greg's fantasy or her own? He's dressed up and she isn't at first. We know that Rachel Bloom and Aline Brosh McKenna, the creators, have differing views on what's going on with the musical fantasies. One thinks that Rebecca is spreading her musical disease to everyone else in West Covina, and they start having musical fantasies too. I think it's Rachel that takes that line. The other one thinks that it's all in Rebecca's head, not other people's. I believe it's Aline that thinks this. But in any case, this is reportedly an area where they differ, just as they differ on the timeline. There are actual articles about this and I read them but I couldn't find them when I went back and was doing research for the podcast so if anybody has links feel free to send them in there's this line in settle for me settle for me in a sad way darling it's fate and this brings to mind all those movie tropes where the girl is obsessed with some guy that has high status in some way or another and he's her dream guy, and she spends a lot of the movie tracing after him. And then there's this other guy kind of off to the side. Maybe he's a sidekick. Maybe he's a friend. And 
he's the nice guy, the good guy, the guy that gets shafted sometimes. And, you know, a lot of the time in the end, if the girl gets treated badly by the main guy, she ends up with this this other guy, this guy that's been there all along. It's such a movie trope. And, you know, that line, in a sad way, darling, it's fate, it always makes me think of that. And this is a trope that Crazy Ex-Girlfriend triumphantly subverts. Greg and Rebecca do try it out, but they don't have a happy ending. It's complicated and conflictual, and that isn't shown as, like, the right choice to make. Rebecca's still on a much longer journey. At the end of Settle For Me, Greg says to Rebecca, what'll it be? Which brings to mind his later song, when he's contemplating his future and whether he'll ever move up in the world. This also goes back to the fact that Greg sort of sees Rebecca as one of those ways of moving up in the world because she's this New Yorker who is really smart and really pretty. He views her as one way of making it more bearable to live in West Covina or possibly a way to leave West Covina in the long run. She's from another place, and I think that's really appealing to Greg. We see Josh visit Aloha Tech, which is based on Fry's Electronics in real life, and these stores are also themed. Some of their themes at different locations are Ancient Egypt, the 1893 World's Fair, Wild West, the Railroad Trains, the Mayans, the Aztecs, Space Shuttle, 1950s retro space theme with Martians, Ancient Rome, Atlantis, and Alice in Wonderland. Interestingly, though, it's Manhattan Beach, California, where Rachel Bloom grew up, that had the Tahiti theme with tiki heads in a rainforest, which sounds like the closest inspiration for Josh's Aloha Tech. Josh asks one of the employees what's new at Aloha Tech, and the employee says, We got Murder Rampage 3, a quest for chaos. The DPS is out of control. Josh seems excited, but it kind of sounded like a precursor to Season 3, particularly the Scary Sexy Lady episode when... Josh thinks Rebecca might murder someone. Josh visits Rebecca's office to get some help with his work application. And of course, he loves the treadmill desk. This is so Josh. He's really into physical fitness and working out. And he thinks it's the greatest thing. And it would, you know, keep him less bored if he was in an office. And, you know, whereas Rebecca was not about physical activity for as long. Rebecca's also basically willing to do Josh's homework for him. She fills out his work application, and you know if they were 16, she'd be doing all his homework assignments and keeping his grades up. Josh tells Rebecca he thinks she should say yes to Greg. Why not? Greg's the coolest. Rebecca's confused and wonders if this means he's not interested in her after all. I think Josh is in the moment, in the present. He's not thinking about being with Rebecca or having an affair yet, even though he might flirt with her at times. Josh just came back from a great weekend in the wine country with Valencia, so he's probably feeling pretty happy in his relationship this week. I don't really think he's thinking ahead at all. Rebecca literally calls Greg, tells him yes, and hangs up. It happens so fast in between other things that I don't think I noticed the first time. Josh also sees a butter commercial in Aloha Tech which says, make an effort, make a decision. Your future is in your hands. And like Rebecca, Josh follows the sign, turning in his job application. Later, on the bridge in season two, we see Greg follow a sign as well. So all three of them actually do this. It's not just Rebecca. They all kind of pay attention to the signs when they're trying to make a hard decision. Whether it's the wise thing to do or not is more up for debate, but they definitely all three do it. I have mixed feelings when it comes to signs. They do make really good stories sometimes when it all comes together and really clicks, but sometimes signs can lead you astray as well. I guess it's one of those things where, like anything else, if you find a balance between signs and using your rational mind to make decisions, you know, hopefully it all works out. But I guess moderation is probably the best if you spend your whole life following signs and don't really use autonomy who knows where you'll end up. And I I think that's part of the reason Rebecca is compelled to do it because she doesn't always know what the next step is or what she should do. And if she's questioning it, she might just follow the guidance of a sign because it's easier and it gives her confidence and conviction that she doesn't have in her own decision-making process. 
So Rebecca and Greg do indeed go on their first date to the taco festival in West Covina. And early on their date, Rebecca says, this is so cool, but what if it rains again? And Greg says, with my luck, it probably will, because when I plan an outdoor date, it's the one rainy day in the middle of a five-year drought. We think he's down on himself and his luck. But a few scenes later, when we cut back to them, Greg has the umbrella up, and so do other taco festival attendees. It actually did rain on their dates. I'm not sure if everybody noticed that the first time around, but it amused me. It was very subtle, but great. We find out that Rutherford B. Hayes is Rebecca's favorite president, and it made me ask why. He's obscure, he's not someone we've heard of as often. He was president after the Civil War ended, had been a Union soldier, was an abolitionist who worked for equal rights and defended runaway slaves. But other than the general good things, I was looking for a reason why Rebecca in particular might like him. He did attend Harvard Law School, but lots of presidents did. Here's something especially interesting, though. Rutherford B. Hayes defended several people accused of murder. In one case, he used a form of the insanity defense that saved the accused from the gallows. The woman was instead confined to a mental institution. So of course, this brings to mind Rebecca's own experience in the courtroom after she set fire to Robert's house. Her mother basically helped her get mental health treatment instead of jail time. During the second bout of this, Rebecca doesn't plead insanity like Nathaniel suggests but instead pleads guilty, which could easily mean doing time. We'll see in season four. Incidentally, Rutherford B. Hayes also proposed reform of the prison system. So we can definitely see why Rebecca might have him as her favorite president. She went through a very similar situation, and that does feel very specific to her. I'm not sure if the creators had that in mind, but it fits really well. We also see that Rebecca's not afraid to tell Greg real things. She tells him about her obsession with the Triangle Shirtwaist factory fire, even though it's quote-unquote weird. So I wanted to look into this fire a bit too. It took place in 1911 on the 8th to 10th floors of the Ash Building in New York City, where the Triangle Waste Company was housed at the time. The fire flared up in a scrap bin, probably from a match or cigarette, possibly from the sewing machine engines. There's debate about whether it was arson or insurance fraud, another preemptive reference to Rebecca's own experience with arson. The company's owners, Max Blanc and Isaac Harris, survived the fire by fleeing to the roof of the building when the fire began, and they were indicted on charges of first and second degree manslaughter. 146 garment workers died during the fire. Many of the women who died were Jewish immigrants, so there's another connection. The owners had locked the doors to the stairwells or exits to prevent unauthorized break-taking or stealing, but as a result, the people couldn't get out, and many jumped out the windows to their deaths. Also, the musical Rags incorporates the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire into the second act, and that's another potential place of inspiration for Rachel Bloom, since we know how much she loves musicals and has seen so many of them but I'm assuming it's also something that is commonly known in New York. Rebecca even talks to Greg about sending cards to her dad after he left and said she put a ton of glitter inside of them. This is undoubtedly connected back to her glitter exploding inside of me feeling. And then they have a whole conversation about glitter. Rebecca says, to be fair, glitter gets everywhere. And Greg says, it sounded like he was a crappy father. He deserved glitter. I throw glitter at him right now. Is there a glitter stand here somewhere? Can we get some glitter over here? That was a great response. I I think that was the perfect thing to say to her, really reinforcing that she didn't deserve to be abandoned and making jokes to make her feel better. And I was really happy to see how Greg responded to that in the moment, since we know how much the situation with her father affected her throughout her whole life. This next part was a really cool discovery. The song that the band is singing in the background of the taco festival is a Mexican children's song, Cielito Lindo. And the most interesting lines in the translation to English are, a bird that abandons his first nest, if he later finds it occupied, it is well deserved. That is essentially what Greg just said to Rebecca. And it applies to both Rebecca's father and Josh. I'm shocked when I look up an obscure reference the show makes in passing and find it actually has meaning. I know Rachel and Aline stuck in a lot on purpose, so it's very possible a lot of these aren't coincidental, but a few may be. In any case, it it is really rewarding to find out how many little Easter eggs are tucked in 
to the episodes. There's this moment when Greg suggests that they go back to her place, but he's misread Rebecca, who just got really excited about the guacamole contest. He agrees to take her to that first, and she says, you won't regret it. Ironically, Rebecca never would have met Taco Festival Guy, and her date with Greg might not have gone sour if they hadn't done this. But it seems like an innocent fun choice at the time. We see Greg and Rebecca sort of quickly descend into a fight here. Of course, Greg is critical of Rebecca for getting into fads when he knows she's going to give them up, but he didn't have to say it out loud, criticizing her stab at veganism. Rebecca stands up for herself and says, okay, you're being really mean, you're making fun of me, and walks away. Greg tells her, I'm just teasing you. You can be a bit of a hypocrite. I think Greg genuinely meant that he was teasing her, but calling somebody a hypocrite doesn't really come off as teasing. Then Greg goes after Rebecca's honesty, calling her bluff on moving to be by the beach. Greg says, obviously something happened in New York. You had a bit of a nervous breakdown. He calls it pretty well, considering he doesn't know for sure what happened. We do see him harp on this over and over again, though. He's determined to find out what happened in New York. You can tell he's really curious if anything happened recently between the two of them. And we know that Greg and Josh have this unconscious competition going on between them. So Greg does have this real interest in winning Rebecca because he knows that she wants Josh and Josh and Rebecca used to be together when they were teenagers. And that unconscious motivation is kind of driving him as well as his other issues with Rebecca. Rebecca counters by bringing up Greg's whole settle for me vibe. This seems to indicate that perhaps the fantasy was in her head after all. She tells Greg it's weird and sad, and he says, okay, well, that's not quite how I remembered it. So there is a little indication that possibly Rebecca was perceiving Greg that way, asking her to settle for him because that's how she saw it, and maybe Greg was you know, making a genuine play for her. He says, the truth is, I don't want you to settle for me. We get each other and we get along. So Greg is open about wanting Rebecca to choose him over everyone else. He also apologizes for what he said. Greg says, I'm sorry, I teased you. I will stop. Let's just go back to having a good time, okay? I think Greg actually recovers and reconciles this pretty well. What he said and the way he said it wasn't cool, but they did both communicate and figure out how to fix it. Greg said the right things at the end and meant them. Rebecca also apologizes. She says, wow, we both really worked through something there, like adults, like we're normal. This goes back to what we talked about in episode two of Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, where Rebecca spends the whole episode feeling like a child instead of an adult. Additionally, it refers to the split she makes between weird and normal, which stems back to Josh calling her weird when they were both 16. Plus, he ends up calling her weird as an adult, too. So part of Rebecca's goal is to be normal or like everyone else. She sees how Greg helped her fulfill her desire to be a normal adult, and that also equates to a healthy choice in her head. But Rebecca still sees herself as settling for Greg when she assesses the situation in the porta potty. He ticks the boxes that so many mention when trying to find people to date. He's nice and smart. She associates time to grow up with settling. Bex thinks she's got to be realistic and give up on her romantic dreams of Josh. But it doesn't seem to sit well with her, nor does it feel natural. Rebecca and Greg can get on as people and friends and still not necessarily work as boyfriend and girlfriend. At this point in the series, I wasn't rooting for the two of them to get together because I didn't want her to settle. I've been in that situation on early dates, but never to the point of physicality since my demisexuality would prevent it from getting to that point with someone I'm not truly interested in. Even if I wanted to choose a nice, smart guy as a boyfriend, my body wouldn't let me if I were settling. While I feel differently about Greg and Rebecca later on to some extent, at this point in the series, I didn't want them to date. That being said, I didn't want Rebecca to do what she did next either. Meaning, it's obviously horrible for her to go home with another guy on their date. But what a great moment before that, choosing between Greg and Pork. Rebecca's healthy choice and her natural instinct. When you hear Rebecca say, okay, you caught me, the way the camera frames it, we think it could be Greg for a moment, but then we find out it's the vegan guy. I wonder, does he have a name? Apparently, according to IMDb, it's Xander, 
because of course it is, but I don't think it's ever said in the episode. Xander admits that he could really go for some Burger King and doesn't judge Rebecca for eating meat or breaking her vegan vows. Although Greg apologized, Rebecca knows he's probably still judging her in his head, and that makes her feel less comfortable than before, like she can't be herself, even if being herself means trying out a bunch of health fads she won't keep up with. Texting Greg that she wasn't feeling well and was going home is pretty bad, though. I do love that Rebecca made Xander the vegan guy wear two condoms. Immediately after sex, she feels bad, though, and it doesn't satisfy her. She doesn't want to stay in touch with Taco Festival guy at all. She seemed to have chosen him as a way to get out of the Greg situation, and because Xander validated her choices. When Greg turns up at Rebecca's house and figures out what's going on, she elaborates on the child-adult theme. Rebecca says, I'm not an adult, like back at the taco festival, like being all adulty. I take advice from butter commercials. I make no sense and you shouldn't waste time on me. There's two different things going on here. On one hand, Rebecca's insecure, feeling like she can't be what Greg needs because she's not sophisticated or adult enough. On the other hand, she wants to be able to be herself around him without feeling judged or made fun of. She's already not totally comfortable in her own skin. She doesn't need Greg to make her feel worse. It's sort of ironic because Rebecca hides parts of herself from Josh, too. But when Josh does talk with her in the early days, he seems to say kind, positive, validating things that make Rebecca feel good. There are a lot of nuances here and shades of gray, so you can understand why Rebecca is confused but it does seem to be an element of BPD that may have predisposed her towards a reckless choice, like leaving her date to go home with another guy. It was an impulsive decision, one that she later regrets, and doesn't fully understand why she made. Rebecca doesn't even think about how Greg could tell Josh the way she behaved. She's only thinking about what she wants in the moment. Of all the things that Rebecca has done over the years, for me this was actually one of the worst in terms of how I experienced it. This is not something I would do, not something I relate to. I was shocked the first time I saw it, and I'm amazed Greg forgives her at all. I know a lot of it comes down to Rebecca's lack of self-worth, as well as one of the traits of BPD, so it's not a judgment towards her, but it is one of her decisions that was the hardest for me to watch, and something she herself acknowledges was a mistake. After Greg's left and Rebecca is just kind of bumming out on her porch, Heather comes over and Rebecca says to her, Do you ever have one of those days where you've done something so horrible it feels like you did it in a dream? And you just want to wake up and you want it to all be okay, but there's no waking up because you did it for realsies? I think I've only had one moment where I regretted a decision that badly and wished I could do it all over, but it's definitely a feeling I sympathize with. I know what it's like to wake up and wish that everything that happened to you was all a nightmare, only to remember that it's not. And Heather in this moment sees how much stress and regret Rebecca is under, and says she feels kind of bad now about writing a paper on Rebecca. She starts being a friend to her in this moment, starts sympathizing with her as a person. She also says, get some rest, kiddo, re-emphasizing the child-adult split which Rebecca weakly protests, countering with, I'm older than you. Then we get a scene where Josh almost tells a patient he has cancer. I can't imagine how well that would have gone over. When Rebecca meets Josh at Aloha Tech and tries to convince Alex, the store manager, to give him the job, she says, I have an IQ of 164, but I know nothing about life. I make awful decisions. There's definitely a difference between being book smart and street smart, or having common sense or emotional intelligence. I've definitely known people who were really smart, and they could draw conclusions really well and put things together and make associations and knew a lot about a lot of things, but you know, then come to find out they you know, didn't maybe have that much emotional intelligence in other situations. Or sometimes there's somebody who's really academically gifted, does great in school, but then has trouble finding a job or making it in the real world. Sometimes people are book smart, but they don't feel like they have common sense. There's obvious things that they might not know about or might make mistakes on. But Rebecca really defines herself by her intelligence. And I think at first she thought 
you know, she'd be able to make it in the world because of it and be a success. But as she's finding out, there's a lot of other kinds of intelligence that she's still learning a lot about. And she recognizes it here and she's really open. She also says to Alex, Josh Chan loves you. And that makes you the luckiest person store in the world. She's so passionate about Josh. The way she feels about him just bleeds through. She almost tears up. Seeing this versus how indecisive Rebecca was with Greg, even though we know from the beginning that Josh isn't good for her, I'm still more on board with Rebecca having what she dreams of, taking a chance and learning the hard way, than settling for someone else. Neither choice is good, But when she's not presented with any good options, we understand why Rebecca picks one instead of choosing nothing at all. Choosing to be alone for a while might help her in the long run, but it won't make her happy this early on when she's not ready for it. It would probably just add to her depression. Rebecca admits to Josh that she's kind of a mess. She was actually very honest with both Alex, the store clerk, and Josh, who was listening, because she's still very emotional after what happened with Greg. She's kind of wearing her heart on her sleeve here. But Josh is impressed and grateful to her for getting him the job. Josh says, you're like the smartest, most badass girl I know. You crushed it in there. He says he's so glad she moved there. Meanwhile, Heather in psychology class says the subject, Rebecca, requires further study and doesn't fit into any of the categories in the DSM. Her professor says, it sounds like she's suffering from a number of classifiable disorders. This is an early sign that Rebecca might need a diagnosis later. Yet, in the moment, viewers lean towards Heather's viewpoint because Heather's standing up for Rebecca and trying to be her friend, see her as a person and not just a textbook case. Heather says, I don't want to label her, I just want to be her friend. She actually quits the class. This is the first time we see Heather quit something. If she doesn't like it, she just leaves. And for a while, that's that's how Heather handles situations. The infamous butter commercial behind the scenes is something we finally get to see in the tag. We find out that the guy writing the copy for the butter commercial, Gary, left his wife for a prostitute and is having a breakdown himself. It's a great example of how sometimes what we take as signs might not be good advice at all, especially if we don't know where they come from. But they can be insight into our own minds if they help us make a decision we're afraid to make on our own. I know someone who flipped a coin to make decisions regularly, and while that maybe seems a little too extreme, it can be interesting if you flip a coin to make a hard choice, and when it lands on heads or tails, that might let you really know how you feel about the decision itself. It can make it a little clearer. Sometimes, though, if a person is truly torn between two choices and they go with what the sign is telling them, it's still an open question whether that will turn out well or not. So let's get into some of the different segments in the podcast. Our first one is Who Done It, which is how many times does Rebecca initiate plans to get Josh, and how many times does Paula instigate them? In this one, there's really only one obvious time Rebecca has Paula hit the skateboarding park with her so she can learn how to skate and give her and Josh something to do together, and she kind of hopes she might run into him there. So this episode, it's Rebecca instigated once and Paula zero. So in total so far, Rebecca's instigated eight times and Paula five. In our Ring of Fire segment, we talk about the fire references in each episode, which refer back to the Robert arson situation preemptively. This time it's pretty clear. Rebecca on her date with Greg says, once a week I googled trivia facts about the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. And Greg says, shut up, I love that fire. That's like my favorite fire. It is kind of funny that Rebecca is still a little obsessed with a fire because we see that come up again and again in her life. Our Suicide Watch segment, we do have one thing. Heather, when she meets Rebecca on the sidewalk, says, How are you? Feel free to use specific words like despondent or hopeless or on a scale from 1 to 10, rate your suicidal thoughts. And of course, this is just passed off as a joke or a one-off, but we know from season three that it's actually going to get to that point and that it has in the past. In our booze clues segment, we do have one thing. Greg is drinking beer at the taco festival, but not right away, only later on when they both are. A lot of the times 
if we do see Greg drinking alcohol, it's in a situation where other people are too. So it's definitely subtle so far, as far as clues that he might be an alcoholic goes. Our Nailed It segment discusses the secret code in Rebecca's nail polish that Rachel instigated. And in this episode, Rebecca is actually wearing red polish the whole time. Red from later in the series seems to indicate her romance color. She's consciously trying to pull herself together and look good. She wears the red polish during the skateboarding scene on the couch with Heather at the bar and at home with her Tinder date during sex with a stranger at the office, talking healthy choices with Paula at home base at the taco festival. It's all red polish all the time. She's being proactive in all the ways she can think of. Now we turn to music notes, which covers the songs and what they're parodying or what they're inspired by. Our first song is sex with a stranger And on the Spotify commentaries by the Crazy Ex-Girlfriend songwriters, they talk about how it's basically an erotic person trying to have a one-night stand. The Please Don't Be a Murderer line was Aline Brosh McKenna's. Rachel says this song was parodying Beyonce's Partition and Sierra and Justin Timberlake's Love Sex Magic. With Partition, both Rachel and Beyonce wear crystal dripping outfits in red nail polish with similar movements. Both are behind a piano. In Beyonce's, you can see female legs with fancy shoes on sticking up from behind the piano. But in Rebecca's, guy legs are sticking up and she looks disgusted as she sings about STDs. They also use the same lighting where it's mostly dark with strips of light. Beyonce is covered in leopard print at one point during the video. And Rebecca dons a tight tiger bodysuit. Both mention guys getting horny. Both mention going to the club in the song. And Beyonce even mentions Instagram, which Rebecca had just checked earlier in the day. The line is all on Instagram, cake by the pound. Interestingly, Beyonce also mentions in another line, took 45 minutes to get dressed up, we ain't even gonna make it to this club, which is pretty reminiscent of the sexy getting ready song sentiment. With Love Sex Magic, there's the profile shots in shadow, and weirdly the same lighting, dark with strips of light. And Sierra's in the tiger suit, So that's a direct correlation. They both wear tiger suits. We revisit the tiger theme when Rebecca wears a tiger mask during the masquerade with Nathaniel in season three. The second song of the episode is Settle For Me. And the dancing is, of course, inspired by Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, especially the night and day sequence from the film The Gay Divorcee. And the songwriters say this originally started out as our pathologies are on a date. That was the original pitch. And they envisioned Rebecca and Greg in the front and then spreading out behind them. They pictured their parents, grandparents, and everyone before them that led to their really messed up date. That would have been a a big production, though, and they decided it was too complicated and too hard to convey. Rachel said she was listening to a lot of Frank Sinatra around that time, and so her original melody was more big band. But Adam... Schlesinger ended up changing the melody entirely, and Rachel liked it better. She said she'd been picturing Adam's more 1930s thing in her head, and that was really more what she envisioned. And Jack Dolgen helped with the lyrics. He came up with the line, if he's your broken condom, I'm plan B, which is a great line. Definitely one of the strongest songs, and Santino sings it brilliantly, of course. So now let's talk about the theme of the episode, which is mostly the connection between healthy choices and settling, whether for a significant other or a job. Josh's dad tells him that taking the job in the radiology lab is the most healthy thing, and then promptly says, now put on all these layers so you don't get cancer. For some reason, I hadn't connected that joke before that he's telling him this is the healthiest thing to do, and immediately after that says, careful not to get cancer. But this job feels like settling to Josh when he could be happier somewhere else. Rebecca sees Greg as both the healthy choice and someone she'd be settling for. But is Greg the healthy choice? And secondly, is the healthy choice always the right one to make? What if you're just going through the motions and don't feel happy or passionate about your decisions? There are times to be practical and times when being practical is too much of a sacrifice. 
it's hard to know when to draw the line. I think about maybe someone in debt and maybe they really do have to make a healthy choice to, you know, cut back on certain types of entertainment or make sure they're buying the cheapest food products or whatever to, you know, to, to really get out of debt and get out of their situation. Sometimes making the healthy choice makes sense and it's the only way out of a bad situation. But in other cases, it's something you can't really compromise on. Like who you get married to or who you decide to date it kind of depends on the person and it's hard to figure out whether you're doing the right thing or not at the end of the episode rebecca's back to eating donuts rebecca tells paula it's so wrong but it's so right that actually applies quite a bit to josh paula says what happened to your healthy choices and rebecca replies led to the unhealthiest decision i ever made Bex's mom calls and she ignores it. And Paula says that was a healthy choice. Rebecca buying the treadmill desk for $2,000 is a good example of why this doesn't work. She buys it because it's healthy, but then doesn't use it, so now she's wasted a ton of money when she could be budgeting. It's no longer a healthy choice at that point. A choice is only healthy if it'll realistically translate into actual healthy behavior and improve someone's quality of life. Truth be told, Rebecca might be a lot happier eating donuts with Paula than she would eating all the health food stuff that she doesn't really care for. Yet, at the same time, this doesn't mean that we're condoning Rebecca making completely unhealthy choices either. It's finding the balance that's so tricky. We have the results from the last poll question in the podcast episode before this. I actually ended up changing the poll question at the last minute because Twitter has this weird thing where you have to only have four choices and they barely let you type anything in like they don't let you have a lot of characters in there so i ended up changing the poll question but this one's better anyway also i accidentally only put it up for a day instead of a week so sorry about that i didn't give people a lot of time to vote the question was if valencia smells like roasted corn what do we think josh chan smells like his mom's cooking got one vote confidence in cologne got one vote guilt and regret got two votes and Sweaty Gym Socks got three votes, so that's the winner. Josh Chan officially smells like Sweaty Gym Socks. I actually have two poll questions for you guys this time around. During the Taco Festival episode, on your first watch, who were you hoping Rebecca would get together with? Greg, Josh, Man Buns, or no one? The second poll question is, Rebecca takes the butter commercial as a sign. Do you follow signs, perhaps more significant ones, in your own life? Always, never, sometimes, or rarely. So you can vote for that on the Team West Covina Twitter. Just head over to social media, follow us, and vote on the polls. I have a couple podcast questions for you guys as well. Is there ever a time when we should settle? Why or why not? And the second one is, when have you made healthy choices and how did it work out for you? If you'd like to support the podcast and production of future episodes, Become a patron at patreon.com slash teamwestcovina and receive bonus rewards. Even if you're not able to support the podcast financially, it would really be a big help if you gave us a quick review on iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, or wherever you get your podcasts. That bumps us higher up in search results, and it really does lead to more listeners. So thank you very much for anyone who's taken the time to write a review. Also, please follow Team West Covina on social media. We've been getting excellent download numbers, but could use some more social media followers. You can reach out to the podcast or start discussions on Facebook at facebook.com slash Team West Covina, Twitter at Team West Covina, or Instagram under Team West Covina. You can also email me at paisley.podcasts at gmail.com. I will mention that in the Acopian's Corner section of the podcast, we're going to be talking about real experiences with online dating. But if you don't plan to join us for a Copian's Corner, thanks for listening. For everyone that's still here, welcome to a Copian's Corner. I thought with this episode it might be fun to talk about some of my real-life online dating experiences and some of the comments I've received from various suitors over the years. I really hadn't had any experience with online dating or really dating in general until maybe the last few years, and it was quite an experiment. (laughs) Not always positive, but definitely interesting. So I have a bunch of comments that 
people have left me over the years in my online dating mailbox and some of them are funny some of them are surprising i watched people who haven't really had the experience of online dating read these and they're normally really shocked but this is this is what it's like out there in real life in case anyone wanted to know um, I haven't really been doing it for a while, but uh, these are from the last couple years or so. We'll start with the Harry Potter reference, since uh, obviously we get a lot of those on Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. This guy says, Your beauty struck me like Voldemort's Avada Kedavra. I could feed you the same Harry Potter run-of-the-mill pickup line like, Do you play Quidditch? I was just asking because you look like a keeper, but I doubt that would work on you. Next we have the pedophile. He says, I've played the big bad wolf in children's theater for years. Now <laughs> that doesn't sound like a pedophile. I don't know what does. The one who needs a babysitter said, I like to date girls who are at least religious some. I am not highly religious, but it seems to keep me out of trouble. LOL. <laughs> the vegetarian, hearkening back to man buns here, said, I pretty much only date herbivores, but I think it would be fun hanging out as friends. The next one I call guy with chip on shoulder. It reminds me of the archetype that Greg embodied in the show, but less nuanced. He writes, Why do most women talk about good men and what happened to them? On most standards, I am exceptional. I always wonder what happened to the good women. Most of the time, it seems they're either taken or the women don't appreciate the good man when they have him. I've been told by exes that I'm the only guy to ever make them feel a certain way and that I've treated them better than any other guy. But just like most, they lack appreciation until I've moved on. So I'm curious, what would you do with this good guy if you found him? Would you blow it? Oh my gosh, definitely blunder than Greg, but there's that same kind of resentment at this stereotypical nice guy or the stereotypical good guy. That This is the kind of the dark side of him. So it was really funny to actually hear somebody in real life express that. One of the guys literally had a username where part of it was not a murderer. <laughs> then we have the actual murderer. A message from a different person said, all you fucking liberals should be shot in all caps. That was it. Had a message from the Hulk. He says, I'm also indestructible. I'm not kidding. If you enjoy anecdotes, ask me why. Then we have the diehard repeat customer, someone that I'd never written to, but who kept messaging me for a while. He says, we are perfect for each other. I wonder if you aren't getting your messages or something. The mama's boy says, so I was checking out your profile and my roommate walked in. She said that if I don't message you that she will. Now she's straight, so I'm pretty sure that's an empty threat. But my mom does have a good eye for beauty, so I thought I'd say hi. And I thought, did Josh Chan just message me? Somebody living with his mom? Then we've got the stalker who says, if I were a lot younger, I would be sleeping on your doorstep trying to get your attention. I wish you all the very best and do not settle. Again, I say, is this Josh Chan? There's a funny little unintentional reference to settle for me in there too. And lastly, we have the fanboy. There was this one time when a guy came up as a match for me on an online dating site and I was in his profile picture with him. Apparently he'd stopped and asked me for a picture when I was cosplaying at a convention, but I had no recollection of it. I had no idea he'd used it on a dating site. Needless to say, we did not go out. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.